So this is the last chapter of this interpreter inheritance. Oh, wow, we are almost done. And last time we implemented classes with method, but you know, for OOP, we need inheritance or something similar. Inheritance appears in uh, object-oriented language all the way back to the first one, similar. Kind of interesting. And I learned that similar is used for, is designed for simulations which I feel like nowadays, if we want to do simulation, we will not use the OOP style, but whatever. <laughs> and yeah, so there is this, in the inheritance, we have these superclasses and subclasses relationship. And the book did talk a little bit about history that uh, the term subclass was first coined to record type that refine another type. I don't know why. It's called subclass rather than subtype then. And then similar borrow the term refer to a class that inherits from another. And then small talk come small talk came along and then we have superclass. C has called it base and derived class rather than super and subclass because I guess in C++, there is also an object layout mixed in and it makes sense because in C++, you will have the subclasses are bigger than superclasses. So it sounds kind of weird. That's why I guess they choose this name. I think it also fits into the the um the multiple hierarchy of classes because you have like the serialization uh is it serialization where you're trying to figure out the um the order that the classes will be in the memory layout for the virtual tables and, and a lot of it is based on most derived or least derived oh uh, okay yeah i guess for multiple inheritance the super class analogy just kind of break. I, I guess this is also a reason. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, actually, I because I'm a C++ person, oh, like my background is C++, so I kind of like these names better. <laughs> yeah, but also superclasses and subclasses kind of, this is uh, a side set is come from the set series with like uh, superset and subset. So also like in statically typed languages, a sub subclass is also a subtype. Not in C++ though. In most other static typed object oriented languages. So back to the topic, we, if first we just need to add some syntax. It's a way to specify a superclass when declaring a class. There are a lot of different syntax like column, 
Java use extend, Python use parentheses, similar put the super class name before the class keyword. Really? <laughs> That's a really weird choice. <laughs> and uh, this logs language, we will use the Ruby syntax with uh, less than. And for the grammar, we just had this part uh, optional less than some other identifier. And for people new to this, um, the book, you kind of generate ASD via some meta programming because Java is very verbose. So, That's, uh, that's a kind of thing they do here. And then they just generate a class from this ESD. And this is a class of class. But it have several fields that we, yeah, we add this super class field. And notice it's a variable rather than just a token because even though the grammar restricts a superclass class to a single identifier, but at the runtime, we need a variable. And since we directly, in this interpreter, we directly just manipulate ASD at runtime, and so we need this. Yeah, so just directly doing this is much easier. Also in the variable resolution pass, And the new parcel code, we just add a little bit to, if we have a less than symbol, then we try, uh, handle that. And then also pass this information around to store it in the AST. Also in the variable resolution, we need to resolve for the superclass as, as well. So since classes are usually declared at top level, top level, the superclass name will most likely be a global variable, but that's, that's not always the case. And, and we also need to make sure it's resolved. And that's why we need to like do it after the defining the local variable part. Wait, that's not it. Okay, I guess local variable at this point will already be resolved. So that's all right. No, uh, and yeah, we have people can write code like this. And so we want the interpreter to catch that. So this clause basically says if the statement um, our class declaration is like we have a uh, uh, we have a name equal to the superclass name, then we just uh, let the variable resolution pass, which is like throw an error says a class can't inherit from itself. Otherwise, otherwise it's fine. And then in the interpreter, we 
Let's go to the interpreter and we evaluate the superclass. And if the superclass is not a class, then of course we throw an error. Yeah, because people can also do weird stuff like this. And then the superclass, we need to pass it, pass it into the constructor, which now also accept a superclass now. The superclass is stored in the field, like just in the like logs class class. Now currently, just with this section, we just store a superclass, a reference of superclass in our class, but we haven't done anything with it yet. And then we talk about inheriting method. And that means uh, everything that's true for the superclass should be more or less true for the subclass. Uh, but that's in the statically type language, we need to like enforce that the subclass must also be a subtype stuff. And this aside with list of substitution principle, like is the relationship, this kind of stuff. If you write OOP code, then this is important because if you don't follow this, you can write a class hierarchy that's broken. Uh, especially it's important in language with like covariant and contravariant, and it become hyper important. But for us, we are dynamically type language, so we don't need to care about it too much. We simply need to make the, when we call some method, we can just call our, if we can't find the method, we can go to our super class. And it's pretty easy, we just, if we can't find the method, if we add here, we haven't returned, then, then if superclass is not now, we find method here on the superclass and that's it. And yeah, we can, we can now write code like this. We can have a superclass with some method and then we can call it. And now currently we're implementing like method overriding, but a lot of times we also don't want to just override the parent method, we want to refine it. We, so we want to like call it at some point, but add some behavior. And currently we don't have a way to do that. And it talks about a lot of uh, languages use, uh, different languages use different syntax, like Java is super, and we will also use super. It's like this. Let me see, like super.cook, it will call the uh, super class uh, cook method, and then we add something else.
And if we run this, it should print both of the string. So we have a new expression, super keyword, followed by hook, uh, followed by our method name. And then unlike call to this, the this super kind of just go directly to search on the super class. The syntax is just the same as same as this, but with the uh, with, with a super, it's a bit different because for super, it's not just a variable. Of course, you can make it just a variable, but he he doesn't want code like this, so he decided to just you can't use super token by itself. And we have a we have a super so our in our grammar super must follow by a dot and identifier. And like other method calls, we can we can get a handle of the method and call it again like this, and it will automatically bind the correct class for this. And this is just parsing. So super expression starts the method lookup from the super class, but which super class, which is uh, so this is the semantics problem. The naive answer is the superclass of this. So we do some dynamic name resolution on this, but that coincidentally produces a, the right behavior in a lot of cases, especially if we just want trivial program to test, but not always correct. If we have a deeper class hierarchy, then in here, in here we have C, which inherit from B, which inherit from A. Here we call C dot test. C dot test we in here is super dot method, so we should go into A and we should call it A, A method. But if we get the super class of this is actually B, not A. So we can't do that. We need to do is when we do the name resolution, we see the super and we kind of resolve it statically to a to the class A. And yeah, this this diagram is just the same thing about like super dot method calls the class A's method rather than other than here. So in order to evaluate the super expression, we need to access the super class of the class definitions rounding the core. 
And at the point in the interpreter when we're executing a super expression, we already lost that information. That's, that's kind of information available statically rather than dynamically. So we could add a field to the logs function. This is kind of depending on the interpreter architecture. In the logs function, we can store a reference to the class owning that method. But there's another way. In the last chapter, we, when we need to support this, we're using our existing like environment and the closure mechanism. And we can do something to do that. And the uh, important difference is we talked before that when we bound this, we bound this when the method was accessed, so it's dynamic. But when we bound, when we bind super, we the sub super class is fixed or fixed property of the class declaration. Every time we evaluate the super, the super class is always the same. And thus we can create an environment for superclass once when the class def definition is executed. And Yeah, when we create a logs function runtime representation, we can we can see that this diagram is kind of what the environment looks like. We, we have this in bound method, and we also have superclass, which is already created when the class definition was created. So this is achieved by you know, our uh, resolver where if we have a superclass, we just add a new scope and and we we'll first say like yeah, super is a variable in this scope. Uh, and then once once we are done, once we are done, we discard that. And we only create the superclass environment if we actually have a superclass. That's why we need to guard it with if. And Yeah, when we resolve the super expression, we just resolve the locals for the super classes and add it into the current environment, which is environment for the super class. And in yeah, in the interpreter, the structure is exactly mirrored. We, we actually have an environment created like this. And in the environment, we add a super variable. And we get the information that where is the super, where is the super class from, from our variable resolution pass, and then, then we can just find it in the environment.
Hmm, I forgot about this. This is basically we need to support the case where we need to we need to like store the super class as the super classes method as a variable. We need to correctly find this. And the environment where this is bound is always right inside the environment where we store super. Yeah, that's right. So yes, we just have distant distance minus one. I don't exactly like how like this code is kind of just based on implicit assumptions, but whatever. Uh, also, because we have a new person, so this all the distance stuff is basically in their variable resolution. That's the information they decide to uh, they also decide to store is the distance of like we have an environment chain, and the distance is the distance of like how many up level we need to search to find our current variable. And after we find, after we find the object, we, we can just bind it. When we fail to find method, we we will like let the interpreter throw some error. Also, uh, there are cases where we can use super in classes without a super class, or we can use super in like somewhere that is not even in a class. So the way to solve that is the same as the last chapter, except we add a new kind of class called subclass. So we in our resolver, we say if we have a superclass, then our current class is a subclass. And then we say, like if if we use super outside of a class or you use super in a in a class without super class, we both like print an error. And yeah, that's it. That's the whole inheritance section where we all also is the first interpreter we implement everything if we implemented that and the next next part will be a new start where we actually in, uh, implement a bytecode virtual machine where we implement this interpreter again, but in, uh, actually more like a production interpreter rather than just a school toy kind of stuff. So yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Yay.